Hello, welcome to NC Continental Prime, with you live from our studios in Lagos, Nigeria. I am Benga Aborowa, and these are the headlines of this hour. About 1,000 terrorists surrender to Nigerian troops. Authorities investigate killing of a man accused of starting the fires ravaging parts of Algeria. And Zambia Electoral Commission temporarily halts announcement of election results. We bring you all the details shortly. Continental Prime begins in the west of the continent where Nigeria's defense headquarters says about 27 terrorists were killed in the last one week while a thousand others have surrendered with their families to Nigerian troops. The director of the Defense Media Operation, Brigadier General Bernard Onyelko, while speaking to journalists in the nation's capital, Abuja, says Nigerian troops have continued to advance their offensive against terrorists, their collaboration bandits and kidnappers across the country. General Onyelko says Nigerian troops' offensive against Boko Haram and ISWAP fighters have continued to yield tremendous results with the arrest of over 50 terrorists while communities and settlements where they have hibernated in the past, mainly in Nigeria's northeast, have been cleared. He adds that a large cache of arms and ammunition have been seized and the morale of Nigerian troops remains high. led to the neutralization of 27 Boko Haram and Iswa fighters, arrest of 51 Boko Haram and Islamic State of West African Province terrorists, three terrorist collaborators as well as 35 assorted arms and 1,051 rounds of ammunition including AK-47, FN rifles, Duska anti-aircraft guns, General purpose machine guns, mortar tubes, amongst others. In addition, 29 abducted civilians were rescued within the period under review. And gentlemen of the press, no fewer than 1,000 terrorists and their families, comprising adult females, children, surrendered to own troops at different locations in the Northeast. In the meantime, to ensure secured a maritime environment and boost economic trade, Nigeria and Spanish navies are collaborating in the fight against piracy, both in the Indian Ocean and in the Gulf of Guinea. The renewed collaboration was disclosed when a Spanish ship, which was accompanied by the Spanish ambassador to Nigeria, Marcelino and Soreña, was received by the Flag Officer Commanding Western Naval Command, Rear Admiral Jason Bassa, in Lagos, Nigeria. To further safeguard the nation's territorial waters and the waterways across the Gulf of Guinea, the Nigerian Navy and our Spanish counterparts have renewed efforts to build our bilateral relations. The renewed relationship was emphasized when a Spanish Navy ship, MV Vigia, paid a courtesy visit to the Western Naval Command of the Nigerian Navy in Lagos. The Gulf of Guinea is currently bedeviled with the activities of criminal elements who take advantage of the limited capability of the navies in the region to adequately secure the area. Because of the impact of criminalities on our waters to the trade between our nations, a secured maritime environment is a contributing factor to the economic prosperity of nations. We hope that while you are here and doing your mission, you, you, you will gladly share intelligence with us to help in solving the piracy and sea robbery activities in our waters. We are very much available. The visit of a Spanish Navy vessel, the Vigia, is just a proof that we want to well, assist and uh, collaborate and cooperate with the Nigerian Navy, with Nigeria in general, in all of the efforts you're doing uh, uh, for the safety, for the security of, uh, in the Gulf of Guinea. 
The Nigerian Navy and its Spanish counterparts have agreed that a secured maritime environment is a contributory factor to the economic prosperity of any nation. Hence, all hands must be on deck to protect the Gulf of Guinea. Now, from the west, we move to the south of a continent, where reports from Zambia says the announcement of election results by the Electoral Commission has been temporarily halted. We understand that some party agents criticised the Commission for attempting to announce some results which had not been verified. Party agents have marched out of the auditorium for a meeting with electoral officials. A huge turnout was observed across polling centres in the southern African, in the southern African country. President Edgar Lungu is seeking re-election but faces stiff opposition from his rival Hakainde Hichilema. The elections have been described as largely peaceful, although pockets of isolated incidents of violence were recorded in some areas. Joining us this evening from Zambia is New Central's uh, correspondent Lydia Makinda, who has been monitoring the elections. Uh, she's here to give us updates. Many thanks for joining us, Lydia. Yes, good evening. Good evening, Lydia. Reports are beginning to emerge that the Electoral Commission has temporarily halted the announcement of the election results. What can you tell us about this and what uh, prompted this announcement? Well, the Electoral Commission of Zambia, the SZ, has been uh, very slow on, um, uh, with, with the concern of uh, announcing the results. So uh, as uh, now they haven't really announced the results, even though some polling stations uh, have uh, started announcing some uh, provincial results, we think to, to, to be that uh, the UPND are leading in terms of parliamentary uh, results. But for presidential results, you know, the Electoral Commission of Zambia are the only, man, uh, the only board that have uh, the right to announce the, the presidential results which they have not announced any uh, constitutional uh, result as of now. And uh, uh, in that as well, we also said that the Electoral Commission of Zambia, uh, Officer Patrick Echindano, uh, he said uh, when we reached a comment about uh, the shutdown of the internet, as you are aware that uh, uh, Zambia right now is facing the shutdown of the internet, uh, Facebook and uh, WhatsApp and other social media, they are not working properly. So he, he said that the, uh, the electoral commissioner officer, Patrick Sundano, said that he is not aware that uh, there has been no internet since yesterday. So we see that uh, they're not really giving us proper um, uh, comment on that. Mm. Addition to that, we also see that uh, um, some two of the presidential party members have uh, already started congratulating the UPND president. So we see that uh, 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 Fred Mambe from... Uh, and the, the uh, Sean Temple from the PEP have already surrendered to be out of the race that uh, the UPND have already won. So they have already started congratulating the, uh, Mr. Harainde Ichilema. And uh, well, well, so, 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 so to the interrupt Electoral you. Of Zambia. Sorry to interrupt you uh, there, Lydia. Uh, why would uh, some party members uh, congratulate the incumbent president when the Constitution says? Uh, the Zambia Electoral Commission has the sole responsibility of announcing results. Uh, isn't that dangerous and irresponsible? Well, they ha yes, it is uh, dangerous because when the Electoral Commission of Zambia, um, uh, Patrick Sedano, said that uh, uh, the citizens should not uh, take that as a serious matter. But even though uh, those people have, have congratulated uh, Mr. Harainde Ichilema because of the results that are being announced from uh, provincial uh, polling stations. So we see that Harainde Ichilema is uh, getting higher uh, uh, numbers from uh, the provincial um, uh, polling station. For instance, I'm going to uh, uh, name some more uh, uh, provincial leading that he is doing. In southern province, he, he, Chilema found seven. 1,845, and uh, Edgar Tangwalungu found 1,389. That's just one of the uh, provinces. Also, we go to Central, where Chilema found 19,500. That is in Chilawombe. Okay, Lydia, uh, uh, let, let's, yes, yes. let's um, 
Well, I'm sure in the next 48 hours, 72 hours, we'll have a clearer pictures and we'll uh, understand what the Electoral Commission is saying. But what's the general mood in the country like uh, with this latest development? Uh, what, what's, what's the country like? The country right now is in a noisy place because the Electoral Commission of Zambia, the slowness of not torturing the results is uh, tempering people's uh, anger. So we see that some, uh, some youth are on their way right now going to Mulungusi International just to, uh, to, to speak their minds about what is happening with the Electoral Commission of Zambia. So they haven't yet announced any results, which is uh, troubling or which is angering some citizen of uh, uh, citizen of Zambia as of now. So the country is at noise because the Electoral Commission of Zambia have not yet announced a result. Okay, Lydia, um, reports reaching us yesterday was that uh, the internet uh, was shut down. Uh, a lot of uh, Zambians could not use uh, social media platforms. What's the latest uh, with that. Elections are over now. Has full internet been restored in Zambia? Not yet, because the, uh, everybody, they are using what is called a VPN. That is how they can access a uh, bit of the internet. By the internet, as of now, it's still down. People are not using uh, the, uh, you know, Facebook, WhatsApp, and other words. But again, when we ask for the Electoral Commission of Zambia, he's saying he's not aware that he does not use social media platform, that he is not aware about what is happening because he does not use the okay. internet. Thank you very much, uh, Lydia. Now that the uh, result announcement has been halted, uh, is that, are we going to expect uh, results uh, in more than 72 hours, or are we still expecting it within the 72 hour uh, time frame as stipulated by the Zambian Constitution? The issues that Chairperson uh, is, is our Mr. Issa would say that uh, he is going, they are going to announce the results in 72 hours. But uh, from uh, we had the press briefing that was around uh, 3 p.m. and uh, when they were about to announce some uh, results, once the chairperson from UPND said that they were not verified. In hearing that, the, the board of the Electoral Commission of Zambia walked away without telling us when the next press briefing is going to be said. So for now, okay. we do not know when they are going to tell us the results again. We are just waiting. Thank you very much, uh, Lydia. Always a pleasure talking to you. We'll keep monitoring the situation uh, in Zambia and uh, Africa and indeed the rest of the world uh, awaits a result there. But so far, the elections have been peaceful. Thank you very much. Uh, always a pleasure. Now, in the west of the continent, staying in Nigeria, uh, the Federal High Court in Abuja has awarded about 4 million naira in damages to six women who were victims of sexual harassment raids at nightclubs in 2019. The court had condemned the action of the personnel of Nigerian police and officers of the Federal Capital Territory Environmental Department. The women who were said to have been arrested and abused also suffered both physical and mental torture. New Central's Edong Joseph tells us more. It was a trial that took over 27 months, with judgment passed on the 5th of August. The Federal High Court in Abuja, Nigeria's capital, awarded millions in favor of six Nigerian women illegally arrested and allegedly sexually abused by men of the FCT Environmental Department and personnel of the Nigerian Police Force between April the 26th and 29, 2019. After two years of trial, Justice Evelyn Maha of the Federal High Court in her judgment on the 5th of August, 2021, held that the arrest of the applicants without cause, the beating, molestation, and dehumanizing treatment, the detention of the applicant, and the barring of the applicant from accessing legal representation was a violation of the applicant's rights as guaranteed under the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Awarded between 2 million to 4 million in damages. Rights activists have described the judgment as a landmark achievement in the fight against gender profiling, the humanization of women, and gender based violence. They say the ruling will serve as a deterrent to future perpetrators.
Now that it is justice to the six women, I wish we also take it as justice to our women. And now the media have now been fully hand with this judgment to also do advocacy for our women that there is a judgment in the FCT that protects women. For the perpetrators, I think it's a new term. They now know that whether you are a state actor or you are an individual, you can be called to question, you can be called to answer to your deeds at any time. It is a story worth telling. And we're calling on all to speak out because that is the only way we can address the issues of sexual and gender-based violence. The judgment restrains security officials from arresting women in nightclubs and hotels. Gender rights advocates say they hope it will bring an end to rates on nightclubs and hotels where women are profiled because of their sex and subsequently abused. From Abuja, Idong Joseph, News Central Television. The umbrella body of the Yoruba self-determination group Ilana Omodua Professor Banji Akitoye will be leading a rally to the 76th session of the United Nations General Assembly in New York, United States in September. The protest is to demand a referendum on self-determination and abolition of the 1999 constitution of Nigeria. A statement signed by the spokesman of the group, Maxwell Adelaide, revealed that the professor of history, who is currently in Benin Republic, will be joined by other leaders from the South and Middle Belt in Nigeria to the venue of the march in New York to make an official presentation at the 76th United Nations General Assembly. Now, joining us now is the leader of the Ilana Omo Dua, Professor Banji Akitoye, to bring us up to speed with this development. Good evening, Professor. Thank you very much for joining us on NC Continental Prime. Good evening. Good evening. Now, Prof, uh, we hear you will be leading uh, your members to the United Nations General Assembly uh, next month to make an official presentation. Can you tell us what this uh, presentation is all about and what you hope to achieve uh, with that visit? Uh, thank you. We, uh, Ilana Amadoua, for the Yoruba people, and very many other organizations also for the Yoruba people, uh, have decided from the beginning that our agitation for Yoruba self-determination will be peaceful and law-abiding. And a part of that process is that we hold rallies in order to enlighten our people, to inform our people, to galvanize our population uh, towards what we are trying to do. And it has worked wonderfully. We held a big rally in, in Ibadan, and we thought it was the biggest we could ever hold. But then the rally in, uh, in Abelkuta a week later was much bigger. And the one in Oshobo later was bigger than the Abelkuta. And so it went on getting bigger and bigger until we came to the, run in, uh, the one in Ekiti, which became the biggest of all. Now we tried to hold one in Lagos. The federal government did an illegal thing. The police did an illegal thing by stopping our people from rallying. Uh, but we are going to repeat the rally in Lagos at some time in the future. Uh, and we are going to be taking action uh, against the people who stopped our rally in Lagos. Uh, but now we must work together with other nationalities who want the same things that we want, the people of the Middle Belt, the people of uh, the east of Nigeria, the people of the south-south, roughly the south and the Middle Belt, want to, uh, to affirm their self-determination, which means that they want separate countries of their own out of the, out of the land of disaster, uh, insecurity, poverty, and so on that Nigeria has become. It is entirely their right to, to seek, to seek uh, self-determination. Self now, right so self-determination <laughs> is a right of all nation, of all nationalities in the world. And nobody can stop any nationality from expressing its desire for its self-determination. Now, Professor Akitoye, you uh, did mention that uh, uh, the people uh, want uh, rights to their own nations. Uh, but the 
Their elected representatives in the National Assembly have not indicated anything of such. Uh, why do you have the idea that uh, the people uh, want no, them? No, nobody can, nobody can expect the elected representatives in the National Assembly to be doing what we are doing. We elected them but, to be in the National but, Assembly. But the people voted them they are still there. in millions. Yes, we are, we are in, in our millions now. We are the people who voted them in, in our millions. We are now saying that uh, the situation in Nigeria does not answer to the kind of country that we want to belong to. That's all. Okay. And so we are, we are taking legitimate, uh, lawful action to assert the self-determination of our various peoples. Now, as part of your protest to the, as one of your demands, uh, as part of your protest to uh, the United Nations General Assembly in New York, is the abolition of the 1999 Constitution. I'd like to uh, put it to you, Professor. What are the fault lines of that Constitution, and why do you think uh, is that, not suitable? That Constitution, that Constitution broadly is a fraud. Hello, Professor Kitoya, are you there? Okay, I believe we're experiencing some technical issues with Professor Akitoye uh, there. Okay, I believe uh, we lost Professor uh, Akitoye there, the head of the Yoruba Self-Determination Group, Ilana Omo Odua. Now, as Africa joins the rest of the world to celebrate International Youth Day, efforts have been made in transforming food systems across the continent by youth involvement, while also highlighting some of the challenges faced by the younger generation towards this, as well as possible solutions. In this report, New Central's Chilima Umosu has more. August 12th of each year marks the celebration of International Youth Day. Youth Day aims to indulge youth in various cultural, legal and other development aspects of society. The day was declared to be celebrated as International Youth Day in the year 1999. On this day, the government and citizens come together to bring attention to the problems faced by the younger generation. Young people around the world are coming together to respond to the issues of poverty, hunger, inequalities, insecurity and climate change. They are demonstrating resilience resourcefulness and leadership while tackling injustice and demanding accountability from calling for urgent climate action and building peace to tackling inequalities and gender biases. It is being celebrated every year to highlight the importance of youth as a driving force of change in the world. The theme for this year 2021 is Transforming Food Systems, Youth Innovation for Human and Planetary Health. It's not just about food security, it is about nutrition security. How do we make sure that this young population, 110, 120 million people under the age of 35, get the nutrition that they need to lead healthy, productive lives? In a panel discussion organized by the United Nations Information Center, in collaboration with Strategy for Mentoring Initiative and Leadership Empowerment, the need for continued support for the youth was highlighted. As young people, you need to embrace uh, agriculture as a business and mindful to act responsibly as custodians of the natural endow endowment which we have inherited. The International Youth Day is celebrated through various awareness campaigns, community concerts and events to bring to notice the social, economic and social political issues that the youth in every nation face. Chirima Unyosu, reporting for News Central. We head to North Africa where Algeria has commenced investigations into the killing of a man accused of starting the fires ravaging parts of the country. Orders of investigation by an Algerian prosecutor have been carried out into his death. This announcement was confirmed by Algeria's official news agency after wildfires killed at least 69 people through the mountainous Berber region. The local prosecutor issued a statement following videos and social media showing the killing of a citizen. The investigation is aimed at identifying their assailants and sending them to trial. Amnesty International has called on the Algerian authorities to immediately investigate the death.
You're watching NC Continental Prime. Coming up on the news, Ugandan Parliament makes it mandatory for legislators to get vaccinated against COVID-19. We'll bring you details of this and more when we return. The African Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Africa CDC, says the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases in Africa surpassed 7.18 million on Friday. The Africa CDC says the death toll from the pandemic stands at over 181,000, while over 6.25 million patients across the continent have recovered from the disease. South Africa, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt and Ethiopia are countries with the most cases in the continent. South Africa has recorded the most COVID-19 cases in the continent with over 2.56 million cases. Even to the eastern part of the continent, the Ugandan parliament has made it mandatory for legislators in the East African country to get vaccinated against COVID-19. The directive is the latest criteria for legislators before being allowed to attend parliamentary sessions. Chris Obore, director of communications at the parliament, says some members of parliament have been vaccinated while others have not. According to Obore, those who have not been vaccinated should get the jabs by Tuesday. Obore said the same restrictions would apply to parliamentary staff and journalists. He said the country has 429 legislators, but they would attend plenary in shifts. Now, moving to the west of the continent, the Nigerian Centre for Disease Control, NCDC, says 753 new infections and five more COVID-19 related deaths were registered in the last 24 hours. The figures raised the country's total infections to over 180,000, with the NCDC attributing the surge to the highly transmissible Delta variant and low vaccination rates across the country. The new infections indicated a decrease from the 790 cases reported the previous day. The new infections were reported in 12 states and the Federal Capital Territory. Lagos State recorded most of the infections with 364 cases indicated it still remains the nation's epicenter of the virus. Now, staying on health matters in the meantime, the state of the Nigerian healthcare sector continues to be a cause of concern and the Association of Resident Doctors has decided to take steps towards addressing some of the pressing issues. At the Lagos University Teaching Hospital, the association's members held a scientific conference to address some of the present issues and seek possible solutions. New Central's Bernard Akede tells us more. Though the industrial action embarked upon by the Association of Resident Doctors in Nigeria is still ongoing, this hasn't stopped the medical practitioners from having conversations on improving the nation's healthcare system. At the Lagos University Teaching Hospital, Luth, the Association of Resident Doctors held their August Ordinary General Meeting and Scientific Conference. The theme, reforming the Nigerian healthcare system for sustainable development. This um, team was speak several months ago um, because we foresaw what was going to happen um, as we got the um, breakdown of um, the healthcare sector. And then we're actually looking at um, ways to refer solution to this perennial challenge. This is the fact that the government alone cannot finance healthcare. So we need to begin to think of other ways in which healthcare can be uh, financed. There's no better time to start discussing uh, the issue of reforming the healthcare system than now. And that was why we, dis uh, we uh, felt that we should uh, uh, begin to talk about this so that um, uh, even at the level of NAD, the Nigerian Association of Resident Doctor, uh, the discussion can also be sustained uh, in order to achieve uh, a sustainable uh, uh, development in Nigeria uh, as a whole. With the increase in cases of brain drain recorded in the country's medical sector, the need for such conversations cannot be overemphasized. Charles Notable Charles panelists Charles at the conference vision. spoke on well, health care finance, budget, innovative, one collaborative one. and sustainable financing options for the country, leadership and governance, medicine and politics, to mention a few. For doctors to, to, to leave this, the shores of this country, 
to go abroad is really not a welcome development. These people, these doctors who are living, are being poached. But in the UK, we have to work out a system that will enable them to stay. The conference could not have come at a better time as the striking doctors and the government still seek mutually beneficial resolutions to the pending issues. What government needs to do more is to ensure better coordination uh, with federal and states and also to align that coordination with clear performance targets that they are focused on. There's quite a lot that government is doing. This year alone, I'm aware that government has also released 20 billion naira uh, through the Basic Healthcare Provision Fund. The states are also not shying away from their roles. If the healthcare is well funded and the resources is managed, and the, uh, the doctors and all other healthcare workers are well motivated, uh, I'm very sure there won't be any need to uh, embark on strike. The doctors hope that all stakeholders in the country's medical sector will benefit from conferences like these so as to improve healthcare in the country. Bernard Akede, New Central Lagos. Now, World Rap Italian firefighters are battling hundreds of fires throughout the country's south that have killed four people, fueled by unrelenting temperatures enveloping southern Europe. Firefighters say they were over 500 blazes reported overnight at the, as the anti-cyclone dubbed Lucifer sweeps across Italy, sending temperatures soaring and causing what is now believed to be a new European record of 48.8 degrees Celsius in Sicily. The heat wave across vast swaths of the Mediterranean region in recent days began to shift west on Thursday, with many of the southern areas of France put under a high temperature alert. Now, a huge search and rescue operation is underway in northern Turkey after flash floods along the Black Sea coast killed at least 27 people. Kastamonu province is the worst hit area, accounting for 25 of the deaths. Two others died in Sinop and the coast in the flooded area near the Black Sea. Helicopters plot some people from rooftops. Others were rescued by boats. The floods caused some buildings to collapse, smashed several bridges, clogged some streets with wrecked cars and cut power supply. This month, Turkey has also had to battle huge wildfires in the south. Those fires, which are now under control, forced thousands of locals and tourists to flee Marmaris and surrounding areas. Now in business, it's Nigeria's small and medium enterprises development agency, Smedin, has blamed the lack of available data for the slow growth and development of SMEs in the country. The Director General of Smedin, Diko Rada, while speaking to newsmen in Abuja, announced that the agency will, from Monday, August the 16th, commence the fourth round of Nigeria's national survey of SMEs across the country. Rada says the need for an urgent survey of MSMEs necessitated the need to ensure sustainable growth of the nation's economy to spark the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and global economies. As important as this subsector, it is still faced with several challenges that have invaded the untapped growth and sustainability. One of the key challenges that have limited the development and growth in the subsector is the absence of up-to-date and usable data for MSME. Unfortunately, the inclusive, effective and sustainable development of macro, small and medium enterprises subsector is largely dependent on the available or usable data. This survey is one important survey that will provide data for government at this point in time to come up with policies and program that will help strengthen our economy and grow our GDP tremendously. I would like to make personal appeal and food for food cooperation of all our respondents across all the 36 states of the federation and the federal capital territory of Africa. Tolulope Adelero Balagun has the rest of the business news. This is business on NC Continental Prime. I'm Tolulakwe at Dileru Balogun. We start in the east where Kenya's shilling extended its longest stretch of weekly losses this year and is on the back foot as concerns about the impact of the coronavirus pandemic 
on economic activity power pressure on the currency. The currency of East Africa's largest economy depreciated as much as 0.2% to 109.37 against the dollar, the lowest level in four months. The shilling was trading 0.1% lower today in Nairobi, marking its eighth straight day and fifth consecutive week of losses. The losing streak extends the decline this month to 0.6%, and a close at the current level would indicate that the shilling is oversold, according to the 14-day relative strength index. According to the health ministry, Kenya had 217,276 confirmed COVID-19 cases and 4,273 deaths as of August the 12th. About 1.92 million people have been vaccinated so far. 2.7% of the adult population have received their second doses. Mauritius has announced that it will fully reopen its borders on October the 1st. Visitors who present a negative PCR test taken 72 hours before their departure will be able to explore the island freely from the moment they arrive. The successful acceleration of the country's vaccination program has allowed Mauritius to progress with the full reopening and the welcoming of visitors into a safe and secure environment. At the moment, over 1.3 million vaccine doses have been administered to citizens and residents. The government took the decision in January to prioritize tourism workers and hotel staff in the vaccine rollout to ensure visitors feel safe and secure. The Bankers Committee says some customers are using expired travel tickets and fake passports to procure forex from commercial banks in Nigeria amid the restriction of dollar sales to bureau de change operators. Apparently, these individuals submit airline tickets to deposit money banks to get the forex, but cancel their ticket after procuring the foreign exchange. In a statement, the committee, after a meeting on Thursday, said that chief executives of deposit money banks labeled such actions as fraudulent and stated that perpetrators would be prosecuted. The committee highlighted the fraudulent activities as lenders continue to strategize on how to curb forex scarcity following the decision by the Central Bank of Nigeria to stop selling dollars to BDC operators. And the conversation around digital currencies continues as another African nation is starting her own. The Bank of Ghana and its partner G plus D are partnering to start a pilot general purpose central bank digital currency in Ghana. G plus D is providing the technology, developing the solution, and adapting it to Ghana's requirements. This will be tested in a trial phase with banks, payment service providers, merchants, consumers, and other relevant stakeholders. The Bank of Ghana has signed an agreement with G plus D, a German firm, to implement the project as a precursor to the issuance of a digital form of the national currency, the CD. The project is part of the Digital Ghana Agenda which involves the digitization of the country of about 30 million people and its government services. Zimbabwe is making plans to boost her exports. Now, the southern African nation says the exports of agriculture and mineral commodities would be the backbone of its policy framework next year as the country seeks to grow exports from the secondary sector. And this would help the country mobilize investment and create employment. According to the Treasury, various strategies will be implemented to attain the growth of value-added exports, with government targeting nearly $1.4 billion by 2025 from about the current $730 million in 2020. The finance minister said that the priority for the 2022 national budget will be value addition and beneficiation of agriculture and minerals. And that's the business news on NC Continental Prime. But there, of course, is more news coming your way. Don't forget to join us at 11 a.m. West African time on Monday for Business Edge, the biggest in-depth stories of business, economics, and finance from here on the continent. I'm Tulu Lope at Belarus, Balogun. <laughs>
upon us, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome as we wrap up the week NC Trend Style. Now we begin in Zambia where the Electoral Commission is getting set to announce the results of the just concluded presidential and general elections which held amid restrictions on internet access and conflict in three regions. 16 presidential candidates vied for the top job, but the front runners remain Edgar Lungu and business tycoon Hichilema, who are both facing off at the polls for the third time. The turnout of yesterday's election is the highest in 15 years, and the Electoral Commission says it is confident that despite the delay in the closing of polling stations, it will be able to meet the 72-hour deadline to release final results. Now to a few posts online, but first take note that these comments are not confirming or endorsing any winner in the Zambian elections. Richie says, this time as the voters sensitize each other and guard the vote. Zambia has voted and change is coming, either ruling party lose or no outright majority. Our country should reach this level next election. Also, we have another comment from Malawi elect who says, Zambia Socialist Party leader Fred Membe has congratulated the Chilema and urges Edgar Lungu to bring him protection. Based on the results that have so far been announced, it appears inevitable that Mr. Hichilema of UPND will win the presidency in this election. Fingers crossed about that one. Win says the government shut down the internet during elections and the head of the Electoral Commission of Zambia claims to be clueless about it. He is under pressure. It's obvious which side he is leaning towards, but it is not too late to do the right thing. Hashtag Zambia Vote 2021. We now move to the sad story of two brothers found dead after being arrested on August 1. They have been buried today in Embu, Kenya, amid calls for justice. Benson Injiru, 22, and Emmanuel Mutura, 19, were last seen alive in Kianjokoma town after the police arrested them for being outside during curfew hours. Three days after the arrest, the bodies of the two brothers were found dead at the Embu Level 5 Hospital Mortuary. An autopsy on the bodies showed they had multiple injuries in their heads and elbows, which the Embu police claimed they suffered after jumping from a moving police vehicle at around 10.30 p.m. and route the local police station. The family claims the brothers were brutally murdered by police officers and protests sparked in the area, leading to the torching of a police vehicle. As their burial was held earlier today, Twitter was heating up with the hashtag Justice for Kian Jokoma Brothers. Here are some reactions. Yuri says, the hashtag is not just about the two brothers alone, it is about every youth who has lost their life in the hands of the police who are supposed to protect lives, but choose to take their lives away. It is about justice to all mothers and fathers who lost their loved ones. Also, we have this comment. It reads, isn't police custody supposed to be a place of safety? No arrests have been made. How do we protect other families from such painful grief and loss? This is the cost of police excesses. Hashtag justice for Kian Jokuma brothers. Also, we have this comment from Raila Odinga, a Kenyan politician. And he said, if the criminal justice system never works, it's must for this family. I join and endorse the call for justice for Kian Jokuma brothers. May their soul rest in perfect peace. Finally, some good news to brighten up your Friday. Starboy has done it again. And yes, we stand. Our winning Nigerian artist Whiskey has featured Canadian pop star Justin Bieber on the remix of his song, Essence. Whiskey made a collaboration announcement via an Instagram post with a poster that read Whiskey thanks Justin Bieber Essence. In a similar post, Justin Bieber on his page thanked Whiskey for the chance to collaborate with him on the song of the summer. Now, Essence, which was released back in October 2020, is 11th track on Whiskey's fourth studio album, Made in Lagos, originally featuring Thames. The song has performed well on streaming sites as well as local and international charts. Whiskey fans all over the world are in all mood right now, and the already popular song Essence has gained even more massive airplay. Now, we'll read a few comments from social media. JJ Amojua says, Essence, check. Essence with Justin Bieber, check. The genius thing they did was to leave the original as it was, and then they told Justin Bieber, do your part and leave the rest. And here now. <laughs> also, Joy Akan says, I've seen arguments about whiskey's essence not needing Justin Bieber. And I can understand your emotions, seeing that the record did not need a foreign artist to get to this level. But it's a naive viewpoint, inspired by protectionism, not the spirit of music or even profit. Whiskey fan? Fan club. All right, we have this comment that says, Whiskey worked with Beyonce on Black Skin Girl. They won a Grammy. Whiskey sang with Drake on one dance. Billboard named it 2016 Song of the Summer. Now, Justin Bieber is actually thanking Whiskey for having him on Essence Remix with Thames. 
big wheels the star other stars want to identify with this is where we leave you this week thank you for joining us on nt trends do well to subscribe on youtube and follow us across social media at new central tv i am shil bankoli have a fabulous weekend the 2021 2022 season of the english premier league has kicked off with Brentford hosting Arsenal. Let's join Udoka and Joku uh, for more updates. And this Udoka reports reaching me is that uh, the English Premier League started uh, with some style. Yeah, of course, for the Arsenal fans, it's a sad one. Um, mm -hmm. They are currently being beaten by Brentford. The current scoreline is two goals to nil. And for the Arsenal fans, well, for Arsenal, they are without the star players, the likes of Aubameyang and uh, Lacazette, so it's quite a sad one for the Arsenal fans. Beginning yeah, and, uh, with a sad one. I mean, what, what what a bad way to start for Arsenal fans. Yeah, of course, uh, it's a, a sad a sad result for the Arsenal fans, and they are actually clamoring for the head of the manager, talking about uh, Mikel Arteta. But let's see what happens in the coming days because the transfer window is still open. So uh, let's see if they can actually get a couple of players into the club. But let's go straight to the other news that we have for you. Let's talk about Al Ali. As Egyptian club side have announced the number of games, Mohamed Sharif will be sidelined after picking up an injury against Ismail. Now, Pizzo Mosimane's men must win all their remaining five league games with Zamalek dropping points in at least one of their games. Now, that mission will become harder after Al Ali and the league's top scorer, Mohamed Sharif, picked up a hamstring injury and will now miss the upcoming two games. A general injury will cause the absence of the international striker in the next two Egyptian Premier League matches against MP and Tala El Gaish. Now, Sheriff is currently on the top of the Egyptian Premier League top scorer's table with 18 goals in 29 matches. Moving over to some transfer stories now, Newcastle United have completed the signing of Arsenal midfielder Joe Willock on a six-year deal. The 21-year-old will not feature in the Magpies opening Premier League game against West Ham United on Sunday but he will be available for the away match at Aston Villa six days later. And the deal is in, in, in excess of £20 million after a successful loan spell last season. The England under-21 international Willock scored eight goals for Newcastle United while on loan in the second half of last season, including seven in consecutive games to help steer the club away from the relegation zone. Bruiser, talking about the manager now, he admitted that at one point he did not think the deal would happen after Arsenal turned down another loan approach. And lastly, Liverpool defender Virgil van Dijk gave a timely boost to the club on the eve of their first Premier League match of the new season with the newly promoted Norwich City by signing a new long-term contract. 30-year-old Dutch international central defender's new deal is reported to tie him to the club till 2025. And van Dijk's absence due to a knee injury suffered in the Merseyside debut with Everton last October cost Liverpool a lot in the defense of the title last season and also saw him miss Euro 2020. Now, he's, a, he's the fourth senior Liverpool player to extend his contract in the last couple of weeks after England defender Trent Alexander-Arnold and Brazilian duo Fabinho and Alison Becker. The Netherlands the captain has made 130 appearances for the club, scoring 13 goals and also collected winners' medals in the UEFA Super Cup and the FIFA Club World Cup. And that's it on Sports Update on Ends Continental Prime. I am Udoka Njoku. Genga has the rest of the news. Thank you very much, Udoka. And uh, before we go um, to join some dandy for the latest in the entertainment, we'll go on a quick break and when we return, he'll tell us his big things that are happening. Essence, uh, Wizkid and Justin Bieber on the same track. Uh, some dandy will tell you more about that when we return. <laughs> Now let's join Sam Dandy for the latest in entertainment. Hi, good evening, Sam Dandy. Hi, Benga. Right. Looking so let's get right into it. Let's just... and ready for TGIF. Of course, as always, as always. Right, let's get right into it. So like you said, indeed, Essence Remix is buzzing, and that is the biggest story at this point in time. Now, of course, let me tell you all about it. So like I predicted, or like we talked about yesterday, the remix has dropped, and just as it was rumored, and now the track, you know, is the thir a 31 time Guinness World Record holder Justin Bieber happens to feature on that track. Now, the Canadian singer put in a caption, Thank you for letting me jump on the song 
of the summer, which he titled Essence Remix. Now, in less than, at this point, 18 hours, the song had over 600,000 views on YouTube, and it currently has 750,000 in a few hours, right? And um, in fact, this is big for the song, and I think it's going to shoot it up even further on the Billboard Top 100. Now, in fact, let's not wait any longer. Let's play Just a Me But Power on the Billboard Top 100. But let's move from that, from music to film industry, as Nollywood Ghost and the Town 2 is set for a sequel. Now produced by Tony Abraham and directed by Michael, the sequel will continue the comic adventure of Isila, a tout with psychic abilities to communicate with the dead. Now, in fact, it's going to be played by Abraham herself. Now, the teaser also confirms um, that she will be joined by Mercy Johnson Okeje. Now, principal photography kicked off, if you remember, in about May, and it's going to be starring, you know, a star-studded cast, including Patient Ozokwo, Iyabojo, Imiedo, Ruwari Pekin, and Nice, amongst others. Well, here's a teaser of that video. For this ghetto, I go kill you. I won't promise you that first thing. Where do this guy say to you? I go help you get her. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. Bring the money, John. They say you are a spiritualer. Spiritualization. I'll be your assistant. Allow me to assist you. If I concentrate, if I concentrate, if I go to Sampu, I'll be your assistant. Hello. There. Now on to international scene, surprisingly, but great news for American DJ Khaled, who less than 24 hours ago revealed that his family recently recovered from the dreaded COVID-19. Now the 45-year-old Dick's jockey then thanked fans for the love, calls, and prayers. He then thanked the doctors that took care of him, his management, and of course the record label for holding him and his family up while they recovered. Now, Khalid joins a list of high-profile persons in entertainment, like Kevin Hart, Dwayne Johnson, Idris Elba, amongst a host of others that have tested positive in the past for the COVID-19 pandemic virus. Now, that's how we wrap up entertainment news for tonight. Uh, for the week, actually. Well, remember to stay safe. The virus is still out there. But back to Benga with the rest of the news. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sam Dandy. Now, let's go to a weather desk for a look at what to expect in terms of sunshine and precipitation across the continent. And that's all on the news of this hour. But before we go, let's take another look at some of the major stories. Nigeria's defense headquarters has confirmed the surrender of about 1,000 terrorists. Authorities in Algeria have commenced investigations into the killing of a man accused of starting the fires ravaging parts of the north of African country. And finally, we told you that the announcement of election results by Zambia's Electoral Commission has been halted temporarily. Do remember to follow us on social media with New Central TV. You can download our mobile app and app store and Play Store. You can also watch New Central live and Star Times channel 274, AVO TV channel 23, Vision 247, Free TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Benga Aboroa.